All right. So just a quick outline. Um, again, Philippians chapter 1, we have uh, studied that uh, it was the greetings of Paul. Philippians chapter 2, he said godly examples. Philippians chapter 3, he told about pressing on, pressing towards the goal. And the last chapter of Philippians is all about joy that defeats worry. All right? And in chapter 4, we have three um, 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 divisions, all right? Chapter, verses 1 to 9, we'll talk today about God's peace. The next, after the resurrection, will be Pastor David, uh, but he will say a different uh, message, which is also exciting. The next week, we will do the God's power, and the last will be God's provision, all right? So that is our topic for the book of Philippians, uh, uh, the three, the three major divisions in the book of Philippians. So today, as I've said, we're going to look into verses 1 to 9, and it talks about God's peace. So please open your Bibles in the book of Philippians chapter 4, and let's read all together. Um, as I read, uh, follow you in your Bibles, verses 1 to 9. All right, so let's go. So therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stay true to the Lord. I love you and long to see you, dear friends, for you are my joy and the crown I received for my work. Verse 2. Now I appeal to Yodia and Sinti, sorry, I can't say the word, please, because you belong to the Lord, settle your disagreement. And I ask you, my true partner, to help these two women, for they work hard with me in telling others the good news. They work along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are written in the book of life. Verse 4. Always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. Let everyone see that you are considerate in all you do. Remember, the Lord is coming soon. Verse 6. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank Him for all He has done. Verse 7, then you will receive God's peace which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard our hearts and minds as you live in Christ. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts in what is true, what is honorable, what is right, what is pure, what is lovely, admirable. Think about these things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Verse 9, keep putting into practice all you have learned and received from me. Everything you heard from me and saw me doing, then the God of peace will be with you. Amen. Bless the Lord for his word. We can see in the first verses of chapter 4 that Apostle Paul loves the Philippian church very much. It is very evident in the opening verse as he said, Therefore, my dear brothers, you know, stay true to the Lord. He actually revealed that the congregation of, his, of the Philippians is his dear brothers, all right? Look at the affection of brother of, of Apostle Paul to them. He is telling that he's a dear brother. That he's telling them that he is, they are their, his dear friends. He's actually addressing them as what? Longs to see you. I love you. No, Apostle Paul was very, very he loves the, the, the Philippian church. And he even actually told them, you are my joy and crown. All right? The first chunk of Philippians chapter 1, you will learn a lot about pastor and their mentor, okay? Pastor and the congregation. Because look at here, Apostle Paul was actually saying that the Philippian church are dear brothers to him. They are dear friends to him. You know, they are his joy and crown. He loves this church very much. And when you are a joy and crown of somebody, it is like you're the favorite of that person, right? Like, if you're the crown of somebody, it's like wearing a red, you know, the, the runner. When you win, when you, when you win there's a, a, a winner's red in, a, in the Greek sense. And that is like something, you're the joy and crown. You're, you're my victory, you know. That's how Apostle Paul treated the Philippian church. And the first Philippian church is really, really close to his heart. And imagine yourself. When your pastor or church leader writes something about you as joy and crown, you know, as friends, as brothers and sisters, isn't that a blessing, you know? Isn't that a blessing if your church leaders tell you, you are my joy and crown, you are my brothers, you are my friends. And I've mentioned this before, be in a church where your pastor knows you, amen? Be in a church where your leaders knows you, okay? You need to 
have a good relationship with your church leaders to grow as a Christian. If you're in a church and the pastor doesn't know you, oh no, how can you be his joy and crown? How can you be his favorite? You know, make sure you learn and you know your pastor or your church leader. And that's how Apostle Paul did. He knew the church of Philippians very close to his heart. And Paul's encouragement to them, number one, is to stay true to the Lord. In other versions, it says, stand firm in the Lord. And you will see here that Apostle Paul is again mentioning to them, it's the same. Don't quit. Don't give up. Press on. Be steadfast. Keep your place. Hold your position. That is what Apostle Paul has been saying all throughout the book of Philippians. All right, from chapter 3 until chapter 4, he's telling them, stay true to the Lord. Stand firm. Press on. Hold steady. Don't give up. Hold your position in your church. Hold your position in the Lord. Keep your place. Don't shake, you know. Though you might fall down. Careful, you know. Stand firm. That is what Apostle Paul is saying. And he has been emphasizing this again and again because many false teachers have been attacking the Philippian church before and that's the reason why he's overemphasizing it to them. And we need to listen to Apostle Paul today, my friends. Many will deceive us as believers. So we need to pick our Bibles and start reading and knowing and studying it because deception will not stop until Jesus returns. I tell you, deception will never stop until Jesus returns. If in the old days, in the time of Paul, the Philippians have been being deceived by the Judaizers, until now, the church will always be deceived by the devil. So what does Apostle Paul say? Stand firm. Pick up your Bibles, read it, meditate it, know it, so that when the devil attacks you or false teachers attacks you, you will not be shaken. Standing firm, all right? He was trying to tell them, love, don't let your love from Jesus go away. Hold on to it. Stay true to the Lord until the very end. The verse, first verse is just really chunky. <laughs> first verse pa lang, you know, it's the first verse, but it's really, really good. And he says here in verse 2, Now I feel to Yodia and Cynthia, please, because you belong to the Lord, settle your disagreement. This verse is the only correction Paul said in the book of Philippians to these two women to fix their disagreement and stop arguing. We don't know what they were arguing about. I don't know what they were talking about there. But these two women are part of the church, part of the congregation, and they have a disagreement. And it was something personal the Apostle Paul was correcting. This is the only correction that we can see in the book of Philippians. In the other books that Paul actually wrote, like Corinthians, he was correcting so many spiritual, ethical, moral issues of the church. In Galatians, he was talking and correcting about the Gentiles being converted in Christianity. In Romans, he was correcting the spiritual doctrines about faith and how it's justified and sanctified by Jesus alone and not by good works. So in the books that Apostle Paul was writing or letters, he was correcting some major doctrines of the churches. But in the book of Philippians, he was just correcting this two disagreement. And it's something personal, all right? It's something personal. So you would see that the church of Philippians is really a mature church, amen? It's really a, a, a mature kind of church. And he says here, um, he says here, please make sure your disagreement is settled. And he said in verse 3, and I asked my true partner to help these two women for they work hard with me telling others the good news. They work along with Clement and the rest of the co-workers whose names are written in the book of life. Paul asked somebody, a true partner, I don't know the name of that true partner, to help this woman be reconciled. Because these two, two women are workers contending the gospel with Paul along Clement. In a church, there could be disagreements, all right? There could be, like that, like what happened, there could be personal issues. But Paul says, fix it, all right? And look at this. And I really like how Paul asked the church to help one another to lift each other's burden. He actually did not say, I will solve the problem when I come back to you. But he actually allowed a 
church member to help fix it, you know? So when your pastor asks you to help somebody, consider yourself a true partner of your pastor, all right? And as a church, let us help one another, be at peace with one another. We need to stop arguing and have one mind and heart towards Christ, all right? And as I said, this is the only correction that Paul mentioned for the book of Philippians, all right? And after that, no more. He just ordered this true partner, fix it, help me fix it, you know? And that's it. I, I, I believe it's, it, it was fixed, you know? And the next verses, he then said, enablement of for living a Christian life. The next verses is, are so beautiful verses because he, he this, these are verses that would encourage us to live a Christian life. So verse 4, he said here, always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. All right. The trials and pressures of life make it impossible to be happy. But Paul did not say them, did not say to them, be happy. What he said was to be full of joy in the Lord. He even said it twice, rejoice. All right. In one verse, he said two important things: rejoice, rejoice, be full of joy in the Lord, and rejoice. And if a verse or a word has been emphasized twice, it means to say it is very important. Don't take it lightly. Take it seriously. All right? So rejoicing in the Lord is having an internal joy when external circumstances are present. All right? It is an internal or inner joy when everything and external circumstances are present. But I need to balance this, okay, about this. For example, you're going through a circumstance where your business has failed or got bankrupt with all the economic crisis, pandemic, COVID, and everything. You know, you do not smile and laugh out when affliction happens. You know, you don't laugh. You know, you, you don't laugh at businesses that that are. You know, you you don't show your face laughing at businesses that fail or even if your business fails. You naturally get sad and down. But because you know that God and hold on to God, your heart is not on the material possession or your business that you hold on. So even if you lose it, you will not go down to the pit of depression where you can drink and lose control. You know, like everything in the world has already faded. Because you know that God will take care of you and you will be okay knowing that better things will still happen. All right? You will continue on with life even if your business has failed. All right? And the external circumstances will not dictate your heart's condition. It, what your heart's condition would be. Your heart's condition should always rejoice in whatever circumstance you may face. Remember this, the more you rejoice, the better you become at it and easier it becomes. Amen? The more you rejoice, the more you will be better with it. So when you talk about joy, you talk about, God, I am secured in you even if the external things are happening around me. Lord, I will choose to say thank you to you even if I don't see good things around. Because I know that in you, Lord, there are better things ahead. That is what you call inner joy. Rejoice in the Lord. All right? If somebody or you know a loved one has a sick or something, you don't laugh at it, okay? You don't rejoice, oh, he's sick. I want to balance that, all right? You don't do that. What you do is that you know you're sad about it. You pray for that person. Lord, I know that this life is yours and yours alone, and I'm going to trust you, Lord, that you can heal that person. That's the inner strength. That's the inner joy, knowing that you have an anchor in the Lord, even if there are storms in life. And that is what Apostle Paul is saying. Rejoice in the Lord. So, friends, if your seatmate is not smiling today, Tap that person and say, rejoice. Why are you not smiling? The Lord said, rejoice, all right? Okay, rejoice. Maybe that person is going through something. Tap him and say, rejoice. Whatever is that, rejoice in the Lord. All right? And he also said in verse 5, let everyone see you. Uh, I, uh, sorry, let everyone that you uh, let everyone see that you are also considerate in all you do. 
remember the Lord is coming soon. In addition to joy, believers are also to be considerate. In other translations, they should be gentle or gracious. We are not to be rough-spirited. Amen? Rejoice in gentleness. That's amazing. People will always notice us how we will react to circumstance or trials, whether we will be gentle, gracious, or harsh. All right? When there is an external circumstance, people will look at us, how will Shalom act to this external circumstance? Is she going to be depressed or is she going to rejoice in the Lord? Is she going to shout or she's going to be gentle? Your reaction matters to people. Amen? So, so Apostle Paul is saying, be gentle and gracious, you know? And a lot of testing about this is seen at home. <laughs> Amen? Between husband and wife, children and parents, siblings to siblings. Take note, we communicate three to four times more by the tone of our voice than by our actual words. I love you. <laughs> I said I love you. <laughs> and now, if you're not, I told you I love you already. Okay? I love you very much. That's so sweet. <laughs> That's so gentle, all right? The tone of our voice is, 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 is more appreciated by people than the actual words. So we need to watch our actions. As Paul reminds us, the Lord is coming soon. So very basic enablement of living a Christian life. Rejoice and be gentle. The next one he said in verse 6 to 7. Do not worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank Him for all He has done. Then you will experience God's peace which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. You know, worrying is problem solving without God. I will repeat that. Worrying is problem solving without God. Worrying is a rubber or stealer of joy. The life we live in it has a lots of concern, or right? lots to take care. You know, so many things to consider. But to take care and be genuinely concerned with life is one thing, but to worry is another. Example, you lost your business and you got bankrupt. Worrying sounds like this. Oh no, my business is gone. I need to pay a lot of bills and debts. I need to find a good job or maybe I can borrow money from a friend. Oh no, what will I do? What did I do wrong? I need to fix it. I need to solve the problem right away. That's what how worry sounds like, all right? You may not sound like me, but you can worry in your mind, all right? Your mind can do that. Paul said, if external circumstances and problems hits you in the face, don't worry or solve the problem without, without God. Instead, pray. Everybody say pray. 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 And the prayer should be an honest, genuine prayer telling him all your concerns and specific things that you need. And you begin to thank him. Thankfulness is the attitude of the heart knowing that your Father in heaven who knows you inside out and that he will take care of you no matter what you are going through. When you lost your business, people who pray sounds like this, who is not worrying. Lord, I lost my business. I do not know where I made a mistake, but please help me fix the mistake. Lord, what are you teaching me right now? Lord, show me. If you want me to get another job to pay the bills, Lord, open the doors for me to get a new job. Open doors for me to pay all the debts. Lead me and guide me, Lord. And I thank you that you're always good and you have never abandoned me. I know you will take care of me in these tough times. In Jesus' name. Did you see the difference of the, of the worrying person and the praying person? More relaxed for the praying person than the worrying person, all right? And as I've said, worrying starts in the mind. That's the reason why we need to pray, we need to ask God for this, because when we do pray, the peace of God guards our hearts and minds. The peace of God protects us, because the mind is always a battlefield. The enemy will always try to inject worry and fear. 
perception. But when you have the peace of God, it acts like a guard. Those evil whispers of the devil cannot penetrate your thoughts if you have the peace of God. Amen? So for example, you're worried about your business. You know, you failed with your business. You, 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 you allow worry to come to your mind. What will happen tomorrow? What will I, how will I pay the, the debts of my bill? You know, and then you will just succumb to so much depression. And then at the end of the line, you will say, I'm just going to end all of it. I'm just going to end my life. Because there's no hope anymore. People do that. Why? Because the peace of God is not in their minds. When you lose your business or you have an external circumstances, that's not the end of it. You have God who looks after you and will take care of you. So if you are succumbed in so much kind of problems, call to God. Ask Him, Lord, help me. I need you, Lord. I give my worry to you. I give my future to you. You are bigger than the future. You make the heavens and the earth. And I know I'm secured in your love. You will help me through. And when you act on that, the peace of God comes to you, and you will have hope. It's not the end of the tunnel. It's not the end of the line. That's the reason why we need to pray. Guard your mind so that the peace of God will be in your heart and in your mind. That's what Apostle Paul said. And do you know that studies say that 92% of what we worry does not really happen? So we better believe in whatever God says because it is sure it's going to happen. The word of God is true and reliable. You know, the cure for worry is a secured mind and a peaceful mind. And we can only have this through what? Right prayer with thanksgiving and right thinking. You know, there was a man named Horatio Spayford. I'm sorry if I did not pronounce uh, that properly. But he was a successful lawyer and a businessman in Chicago with a lovely family named Anna. And they have five children. However, they were not stranger to tears and tragedy. Their young son died with pneumonia in 1871. And in that same year, much of their business was lost in a great Chicago fire. Yet God in His mercy and kindness allowed the business to flourish. On November 21, 1873, the French ocean liner called uh, Ville de Hue, sorry, can say that as well, was crossing the Atlantic from the U.S. to Europe with 313 passengers on board. Among the passengers was the wife, Anna, and their four children. Although Mr. Spayford had planned to go with the family, he found it necessary to stay in Chicago to help solve a business problem. So he told his wife he would join the children in Europe later, a few days later. His plan was to take another ship. However, about four days into crossing the Atlantic, the, the vile defure and the powerful iron hold Scottish ship, the Loch Earn, sorry, I can't pronounce those names, began to collide, they crashed, and suddenly all of those on board were in grave danger. Anna, the wife, hurriedly brought her four children to the deck. She knelt there with Annie, Margaret, Lee, Bessie, and Tanada, and prayed that God would spare them if that could be his will, or to make them willing to endure whatever is awaited for them. Within approximately, um, I think it was approximately 12 uh, minutes, the ship slipped beneath the dark waters of the Atlantic, carrying 226 of the passengers, including the four children of Spayford. So they died. But a sailor rowing a small boat over the spot where the ship went down spotted the woman floating, and it was Anna, and Anna was still alive. The four children sank down in the deep. He pulled her into the boat and they picked up another large vessel after nine days. And to cut the story short, she called Mr. Snape Spayford in a telegram and placed it on the office. Another of the ship's survivor, Pastor Ways, later called Anna saying, God gave me four daughters. Now they have been all taken away. Someday I will understand why. Mr. Spayford booked passage on the next available ship and left to join his grieving wife, and they went together. 
When the ship about four days out, the captain called Spafford to the cabin and told him they were over the place where his children went down. So he saw where the children went down. And according to um, Ber Bertha Spafford Bester, a daughter born after the tragedy and the peace of God that surpasses all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Imagine Mr. Spafford lost his business with a fire, lost four of his children during a tragedy in a ship, had Anna left his wife, had one daughter left, you know, after the, after the, um, after the tragedy, they, they had another daughter, and that's all he had. How can he write a beautiful piece of song? After this, he said, like sea billows roll, Whatever my lot, it has taught me to say, Jesus, it is well. It is well with my soul. Whatever happens, the peace of God is in his heart. It is well because Jesus is still with him. Amazing testimony. We haven't been to that, that, that problem where four children, I, you know, I, I cannot imagine losing my children or my, my husband. But you know, the peace of God amazing peace of God and that's what the what the, this is what Philippians 4 is talking telling us we need to guard our minds and pray and ask the peace of God when there's in, in external circumstances happening around us so that we can say Lord it is still well it is still okay everything's gonna be okay because I have Jesus in my heart amen the last two verses, because we have the right thinking now, Apostle Paul is saying here, now brothers, one final thought, fix your thoughts on what is true, honorable, right, pure, lovely, admirable. Think of things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Friends, remember our thoughts come from three sources, the Holy Spirit, the human spirit, and the demonic spirit. Three sources of thoughts. Allow the Holy Spirit to enter your mind. Your human spirit should be submitted to the Holy Spirit. And when the demonic spirit goes to your mind, rebuke it. Tell him, you're not welcome in my mind. Because your thoughts are always the battleground. And to, you know, when I was young, I think I was the age of Amanda, my mom taught me about this. Because anything that we let our minds enter, it will manifest in ourselves. When I was a kid, my mom was really guarding what I watched in the television. Because what I watch in the television will go into my mind. My mom and dad was guarding me with what I read. Because whatever I read can come to my mind. You know, and the, and the Apostle Paul was saying this, guard your mind. And you know, the, the things that Apostle Paul would actually be like a gate in your mind, you know? He was telling, if this gate, if this things, you know, is it true, honorable, lovely, is, if this passes the gate, then let it, let it in, if that thought passes the gate. So if you think about those things, ask yourself, is this thought true? True is the opposite of dishonesty or lie. If the thought comes in your mind, is it honorable? Are those thoughts worthy of respect? The thought, is it right? Are the thoughts coming to your mind conforming in God's standard? Is it pure? Are the thoughts wholesome, not mixed with moral impurity? Is it lovely? Are the thoughts promoting peace, not conflict? Is it admirable? Are the thoughts constructive rather than negative and destructive? Is it excellent? Are the thoughts going to your mind excellent with moral excellence? And are the thoughts worthy of praise? Are the thoughts something to be commended? If the thoughts passes the gates of these eight things that Paul, Apostle Paul said, welcome it. But if it does not pass the test, do not think about it. Reject it. Because Satan will try to put things in our mind. Now test those thoughts. Are the thoughts that you're thinking lovely? Are the thoughts you're thinking respectful? Are the thoughts you're thinking pure? Is it moral excellence? Is it lustful? If it's lustful, take it off. Is it a lie? Is it a gossip? Take it off. Don't think of these things. And even the things that you're watching, is it full of bad words? Take it off. Are the things you're playing good? Take it off. It's not good. Take it off. The things you're reading, is it pleasing to the Lord? Take it off. It's not pleasing. Because you need to guard your thoughts. We need to guard your thoughts. Ephesians chapter 6, 17 says, Put on the salvation as your helmet. Take the sword.
of God. Your salvation is the helmet that protects your mind. Amen. I've said this before. I was in a swimming, you know, with with, with Elijah. Um, I was bringing him to a swimming uh, swimming class, and while he was swimming, there's this sudden I don't know where it came from. I said this in a testimony before. A sudden sudden lie of the enemy, and the enemy was telling me, "Shalom, you are not worthy to preach on Sunday. Shalom, you are not worthy to to to, to look at Jesus right now because you've done this, you've done that." And I felt so embarrassed. You know what I did? I really said to the devil, "You keep quiet." Because the word of God say, I am precious in the sight of Jesus. The blood of Jesus washed my sin away already. You better keep quiet, devil. And the thought just went out. I did not let it pass my mind or even think about it. I had to recite Bible verses so that so that the devil will keep quiet. Because the word of God is so strong. He's afraid of it. So Apostle Paul says, Put on salvation as your helmet. You know, in the last verse, he said, keep putting to practice everything you learned, everything you heard. Don't just put it on one ear and get out of the other ear, you know. Don't just hear it this Sunday and tomorrow you will do another. No, put into practice from Sunday to Sunday. Whatever you hear from the Lord, put it into practice. That's what Apostle Paul is saying. Amen. In conclusion, you know, there are so many teachings of Apostle Paul. But in conclusion, Philippians 4, 1-9 says, Number one, stay true to the Lord. Amen? He also instructed us to what? Rejoice in the Lord. He also instructed us, be considerate or gentle. He said, the Lord is coming soon. He also said, don't worry about anything. But what? Pray about everything. Because when you pray, the peace of God will come to our hearts and minds. And when the peace of God comes to our hearts and minds, make sure we fix our thoughts to what is true, what is honorable, what is right, what is pure, what is lovely, admirable, excellent, and worthy of praise. And Apostle Paul was saying, put into practice all we have learned and received. Amen? Who got something this afternoon? A very chunky word of God. Very meaty word of God. And tonight as you go home, I want you to again read Philippians 4, 1 to 9. And begin to meditate on the scriptures. Because this is really powerful and true. And because this is Resurrection Sunday, Jesus is able to help us. Amen. Tell yourself, Jesus is able to help me because he is alive. I can do what Apostle Paul is saying because Jesus is able to help me. Amen? Amen. Amen. So let's all stand in closing and let's just thank the Lord this afternoon and ask the Lord to really help us. Lord, help us to really appropriate your word every day in our lives. Help us to fix our thoughts to what is good, what is honest, what is lovely. Help us not to worry, Lord. Help us to pray and let the peace of God come into our hearts. Just begin to ask the Lord in your own time right now. Just ask Him, Lord, help me. Help me to live a Christian life. Enable me, Lord. Enable me today.